afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green Sync Tech Hawaii, Monday, August 30th, 2021. Thank you very much for attending. All of you know that Hawaii was the first state to declare 100% clean energy by the year 2045. Question, how in the world are we going to achieve that very, very, very powerful vision. Part of it, a large part of it, is due to old Seoul up there. We have the best sun regime in the entire nation, not surprising. And back in the 1970s, we started really pushing uh, solar water heating, which is great. You get all the water heated during the day. People come home from school in the evening just when the sun's setting and you've got an 80 gallon battery full of hot water there that really, really helped us keep dollars in Hawaii instead of exporting the dollars to the oil people overseas. Then of course came PVs, photovoltaics, solar energy to electricity, and we succeeded wildly in that so much so that in the middle of a sunny day, there was too much electricity being produced and the utility was actually having to dump it. So then came solar batteries. They're about half the size of a refrigerator installed in garages or just outside. And they take all that excess daytime electricity from the sun, store it and then use it in the evening just when the sun's going down and when we have our peak demand when we're using most electricity. So we're adding layers of complexity, but if we're gonna to get to 100% clean energy, we're gonna to have to get a lot more complex than that enter. Our guest today, Robert Rocky Mould, president of Hawaii Solar Energy Association and a long, long, long time involver in the clean energy field, one of the true subject matter experts in the field. Welcome, Rocky. I've just set the table. Can you talk about DER, distributed energy? Yeah, go ahead, Rocky. Resources, yeah. <laughs> Th thank you so much, Howard. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, so uh, yeah, we've I've worked with Howard for for many years now um, uh, in the the Hawaii ecosystem. So it's great to great to be on. Uh, yeah, that was a really good description of sort of the sequence of of where we are now. Um, you know, I, I rep now represent the Hawaii Solar Energy Association. You know, we are you know the the uh, the largest um, uh, solar uh, trade organization here in Hawaii. Um, I represent you know over a hundred. Install, local installers, as well as national and international uh, equipment manufacturers um, that are all trying to, um, you know, work on uh, this, this complex problem um, of getting us to 100% renewable energy uh, as quickly, uh, as cost effectively uh, uh, as possible. And distributed energy resources um, are, 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 have been leading the way. Um, uh, and distributed energy resources are, are what Howard described. They are, um, you know, rooftop solar and battery storage, as well as um, uh, solar hot, hot water, uh, both in, on residences as well as uh, in, the, in the commercial space. And really, as we as we get to you know, high levels of penetration, I think Oahu, we're at, we're at about 30, 30 percent, 35 percent. Sorry, I don't have the exact figure. I should know that. Um, but the state is at about 35 percent right now in terms of penetration. Um, as you get higher and higher, you sort of have you, you get you have more um, systems to manage and and getting them to interact with the grid and and to set the incentive levels correctly um, for through pricing signals um, to uh, cost effectively shift you know uh, that that solar generation in the midday to the peak period in, in the evening but also to shift behavior and to shift behavior of customers so that they use you know energy at at at, at times uh, and store energy when they need to and we're in a really um exciting time i'll probably get, get more into that um 
you know, as we retire fossil fuel plants, the, 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 the recent, the retirement of the AEF coal plant is happening next year. And doing some modeling, the Public Utilities Commission and HNEI, the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, uh, and along with HECO, saw potential energy shortfall um, due to the retirement of that large, you know, 180 uh, megawatt fossil fuel plant. Um, so the PUC has asked, asked the parties in what's called the DER docket to come up with ideas for how to use uh, distributed energy resources, rooftop solar and storage, as a system resource to help, you know, fill uh, that energy shortfall. And so we're getting into sort of a new era more quickly than, you know, than, than we thought, um, where distributed rooftop systems are being organized and pooled together as a, as a fleet to be a system resource, to be a large resource, to meet a, a big, you know, sort of grid need. Um, and, you know, HSDA through the, through the DER parties, you know, put a proposal together, um, uh, which was called a scheduled dispatch program, um, which actually is doing exactly what, what Howard said. It's actually um, providing a performance payment, an upfront performance payment to, um, for someone to add additional storage uh, to their system. Uh, and that storage, that system will have to be preset in a certain way so that it does, it takes energy from the midday Solar, solar generation and shifts it into the 6 to 8 uh, p.m. peak time period. So I think, really you know, the future really is, is the, the future really is, you know, um, you know ha having sort of a customer-focused uh, market that a sustainable, a sustainable market for, you know, customer-sided systems um, that, are, that are actually being managed um, um, by some kind of central operator or, or pre, in this case, it's being preset, but eventually it'll be there will be actually a central operator that will that will will manage those resources and 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 the timing uh, of when they'll be turned on and turned off. And add into that, and the, and the really exciting, a uh, really exciting thing right now is is really electrifying sort of sort of everything, and and that includes our transportation fleet, and getting the technology to organize. When EVs are charging um, from solar energy and from batteries is is sort of where we're going, and um, and there's just a lot of innovation uh, is occurring uh, in this space, and it's just really exciting to be to be doing this in Hawaii because Hawaii is truly a unique place uh, to be doing this. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned EVs, electric vehicles, as I understand it, electric vehicle owners can enter into an agreement with the utility saying utility says hey you've got a lot of electricity stored in that big old battery we could use some right now we're going to tap into this can you give us a break for that is that part of our our future actually using ev batteries as part of one of those storage options i think that is part of our future that's what we're going for it's not there yet, um, but but you know an EV battery is is has more capacity and, and more power potential than than the batteries that we're putting on our homes, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. it's a really powerful battery. So getting the you know the the vehicle to grid or building to grid um, or building building to vehicle type technologies, connecting those all together uh, is is happening. It's 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 coming. But it's sort of not quite there yet. Um, I think mm -hmm. you know the, one of the exciting things in Hawaii is we have this this amazing test bed because we are an isolated grid, um, and we actually have a pretty pretty small you know pretty small island where EV ranges work really well. So we don't have a lot of the problems that they have on the mainland in terms of range anxiety. Um, and so we are just a great place for electric vehicle companies and you know, energy charging, you know, infrastructure companies to come and prove out sort of new business models and, and ways of, 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 of having vehicles and the grid and solar panels, you know, all work together. Yeah, that's a really exciting possibility. And hopefully, hopefully we're going to get more and more and more and more electric vehicles on the road. 
because if we're going to be electrified, we've got to have our cars electrified also. But in terms of this grid interconnection, there are tens of thousands of PV systems out there sitting on tens of thousands of roofs. How in the world do you get them to interconnect with a, a, a grid? It sounds absolutely mind boggling. Yeah, no, it's that. I mean, there's some really, um, really smart guys, smart minds are, are, are looking at that problem mm -hmm. and, and what you need going forward. You know, a lot of it, a lot of it's in. It's called it's the inverter technology um, that you know controls um, you know the the PV panels and and controls um, you know the interconnection point to the grid. Um, and it's 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 firmware and kind of software that like is set in those. In, in the systems um, to, to, to respond to a signal, um, like some kind of remote signal, um, you know, mm -hmm. via telecommunications or like some kind of, you know, uh, mesh net type of, type of portal. Um, so, you know, it's, that stuff is in, is in that firmware and, and it, it's just the, sort of the, the, the processes for how to go about doing that are still being worked out. I mean, there's a really, there's a big process to get the interconnect, the intercommunication, you know, the communication protocols together uh, for for those inverters that will enable them to do that. That will enable them to be remotely dispatchable, uh, is, is what what we say. Um, so all of that work is happening uh, with with you know with with Hico and in, in, in the DER docket um, and the grid modernization docket before the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, there's a big proceeding. In um, uh, in California, that's looking at the, the the new sort of communication standards that are being put in inverters. And HSDA and my member companies are, you know, luckily at the you know, you know at, at the table, looking looking in on those those proceedings and and um, and intervening and putting our comments where we can um, to to help lead the way. And Hawaii really is, as I was saying, because of the our unique circumstance of being you know an isolated grid. And we really are at the forefront on a lot of this stuff. In fact, I've heard, I've heard California is actually looking at what we're doing with our emergency, you know, DR program. When I was mentioning before, with the retirement of the AES coal plant and our scheduled dispatch or, or battery bonus program, I've, I've heard that California utilities in California or, or the commission in California is looking at that as a potential model to get ready for next year's fire season. Um, cause you know, they've ha been having significant issues with, um, you know, with their transmission lines, um, uh, and generation going down because of, you know, the fire season. Um, so, um, DERs, you know, rooftop, you know, solar and storage just on its own, I mean, helps for resiliency purposes, uh, w when you have, you know, grid outages that occur, if you, if you think about it, if, you know, if we have 70,000 customers who have distributed systems here, um, you know, not all of them, obviously, I, not all of them, I think, can, can go, uh, you know, if, if they're off grid, but a significant portion of those will be able to island in the case of a grid outage. And that, that's 70,000 customers that aren't, that the HECO's not going to need to worry about as much to get interconnected to get them power that they need. And that actually happened in California with the last fire season. There was something like 38,000 uh, systems that, that kicked in. Um, when the grid went down um, because of fires and, you know, kept people's lights on, kept people's refrigerators going, kept people's water pumps going, kept their medicine cool, um, you know, when, when the grid went down. So it's, there's, there's also a significant resilience benefit to distributed systems. Yeah. And as I understand it, with this, this island effect, I, I like that. Um, normally, a PV system on somebody's roof is feeding into the grid or feeding into storage. And what a utility doesn't want when a, the whole grid goes down is people still feeding electricity into those wires. That is not a good thing for the repairmen who are up there on the wires. So you shut, there's a capability of in that shutdown grid off, you shut down the interconnection between the residential system and the main grid, and now you can use it. You can have it all all by yourself. Is that a right. very simplistic explanation of that? 
That's a, that's a very good explanation. Um, you know, this can be done, you know, back in the day, it was done physically with an actual switch that you would, um, you know, pull. Now, through inverter technology, it's getting much more sophisticated and much more um, sensitive. I mean, there are, you know, inverters are sensitive to, you know, grid conditions um, and are able to automatically shut down and modulate um, um, exports or imports based on grid conditions. Uh, and that's all, again, all that inverter technology, which is, which is really the brains of the systems that we're, we're putting on these days. Beautiful. Yeah, and, and, and sure. islanding, and anyway, islanding can be done at various different scales. If you think about it, um, it can be, you know, it can be done, you know, at, at a home. It can be done on a fleets of homes. It can be done for businesses that might want to, you know, might become a resilience hub. Um, there's microgrid technology, which is, which is, you know, and, and microgrid processes um, that are, and, and tariff structures that are being thought about and formed uh, here. Um, uh, to, you know, to to come up with the rules of the road for this new future that we're going into. I mean, I think it's really important to 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 make this point. A lot of this is about setting the incentives properly through through rates and through tariff structures and programs. And what we're doing right now um, in you know before the Public Utilities Commission in the DER docket in particular is setting those sort of new rules of the road. Um, the, the new tariff structures and incentive payments going, you know, incentive structures going forward. And of course, uh, there's also, you know, there was the performance-based regulation proceeding still ongoing before the commission that actually was um, looking at um, rewarding the utility um, for, you know, achieving public policy or, or other kind of grid goals so that their profits, so that their, their revenues would be tied um, uh, to sort of societal public policy goals to, you know, like our 100% renewable energy mandate, things like that, as opposed to sort of the, the sort of old way of, you know, utility rate making, which is really based on, on cost. Uh, and so that was, you know, embedding some, some not great incentives into the system. Mm -hmm. did, did we think of that or are we following California or another state on, on that initiative? I think we're we're one of the the states leading the way. Um, you know, I think you know um, there. You know, New York, um, uh, gosh, Minnesota have done. In California have done whole parts of this, but I think our you know, and and there's always been you know you know um, you know uh, this type of um, you know performance based rate making. You know, in terms of um, you know you know revenues. You know, having a an automatic, you know, um, uh, rate um, rate setting um, mm -hmm. that that would take sort of the utility out of they would they would get a re get their required return regardless of you know of of sort of you know what they were doing and by by setting the automatic sort of an automatic revenue sort of formula they're actually taking sort of this this incentive to invest um, uh, out uh, of the system. But you know, so places have been putting that type of rate making into place. But I think where Hawaii um, really is, is sort of ahead of the game is is on the performance incentive mechanisms that are really tied to some of the 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 the, the higher level um, you know public policy and societal goals in terms of you know greenhouse gas emissions and things like this. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, to shift gears to something much simpler, maybe it's more simpler, maybe not. Um, it's called uh, time of use pricing. And I know Hawaiian Electric is has been doing a pilot project for a long time, but how about this real simple idea? We've mentioned that during the middle of a sunny day, you have all this electricity that is being produced much, much, much more than is being used at the time. What about incentivizing Mr. and Mrs. Housewife to, at that time, just say the real peak starts at uh, 11 in the morning, boom, 11 in the morning, the dishwasher comes on by, by itself, you've timed it. And then at 1230, the clothes washer comes on and at two o'clock, 
the dryer comes on all automatic so you can suck up a lot of that uh, energy you mul multiply that example by 10,000, 20,000 households, and you're, you're talking some pretty, pretty serious energy here. Has that uh, been thought of uh, yet? Well, yeah, there is a, a program um, where uh, solar hot, you know, wa hot water heaters are, are connected mm -hmm. to the utility, uh, a residential load um, um, uh, demand response program. So that, that, so yes, that stuff's been thought of, um, um, but you know, Hawaii were, you know, we are, the DER parties and HSE is being part of them. We've proposed a time of use rate structure um, uh, before the Utilities Commission, and we're, you know, hoping for an order sometime soon on that. Um, you know, the other interveners in the docket have also put their ideas in for a time of use uh, type of rate. But the stuff you're talking about where you're, you're tying in appliances, you know, automatically to those time of use, that's an interesting idea. I'm pretty sure folks are, Folks are looking at that. I haven't heard of much of that here, um, but you know, you know, specifically, I think that's more on the sort of energy efficiency side of things, um, which is always you know super important. Um, but yeah, I think you know the Department of U.S. Department of Energy has a whole you know um, you know smart homes um, program that's looking at, at these how to again how to integrate all of these you know your energy use your appliances, your, your solar, your battery storage, your electric vehicle, how you sort of integrate all of that stuff, you know, through technology um, um, and through, you know, inverter settings and have it all connected to some kind of a remote, uh, remotely dispatchable, you know, or, or an operator that, that's looking at the whole grid and what the grid needs are. That, that is coming. Um, uh, it's still, it's taken a while to work all the pieces out, you know, I mean, you know, um, homes you know last for for a really long time 50 years and more and so you know a lot of our built environment still needs to be you know upgraded to be able to do this kind of stuff um and, and that's a lot what you know you know what a lot of what you do at the at the codes council howard in terms of you know you know updating energy codes energy efficiency type stuff yeah just just a little aside on resistance heaters those are the water heaters that you and i grew up with in our homes and all they are are big tanks with these heating elements in them and when you want hot water boom a heating element goes on and it just stays there until the water is heated up to usually 125 130 degrees now when i first started with the energy office which was just about the time your, your parents uh, met one another, the typical residential electricity bill or consumption was around 1,000 kilowatt hours a month. Now it's 600 kilowatt hours a month. And you say, wait a minute, there are so many more electric using items within a home, especially if you have kids and you have six jillion video games or whatever you have, it, three televisions and a refrigerator that makes ice and does everything else but wash the dishes. Shouldn't the per capita electricity use in a home be going up, up, up? No, largely because- Yeah, so I mean, so- yeah, energy efficiency is, is has been a huge success. Um, you know, uh, you know, going forward, like while I mean, and, and there's this, there is this kind of, uh, there's this effect where when someone puts on, you know, solar, they may use a little bit more energy, mm -hmm. but um, but all, all their appliances are now so much more efficient that we're we are seeing, you know, um, electricity usage, you know you know, going down um, because of energy efficiency and because of solar hot water being yeah. put on, you know, um, you know, put on. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, getting people's behaviors to change is, is still probably one of the most difficult things to do. Um, and so, you know, luckily through improved efficiency and technology, we're, we're, we're getting at a lot of that. Um, uh, but still there's improvements that need to, ha to, to, to be made Absolutely. for sure. Well, back in the day, if you did a pie chart of residential energy use, 
would go to hot water heating, put that solar on the roof, and it goes down to more like 4% maximum because most solar water heaters are sized such that you virtually never need the, the backup heater. So that, that was one of our great, great, great innovations uh, uh, way back when. Rocky, we've only got about two more minutes. Give us a, a scenario of the grand future of all of these thousands of systems interconnected such that only as much electricity is being used as is needed at that second. And the minute the demand drops, the supply drops. Total, total integrations of thousands of individual items. Well, yeah, you know, that's hopefully where we go. And it's all, you know, most of it is going to be, you know, fueled by the sun, right? I like mm -hmm. to think of solar energy as the, the fuel of the future. Um, because that is such an abundant resource here, and it's our ability to, to 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 take it in when it's available, and then use it when we need it. That's kind of the the simple thing, the simple thing for the future. Another thing, um, uh, it's going to be a complex thing for the future, but it's you know, but we'll see. Another thing I'd like to add is it's really important to to start looking. There's other other ways that you know, and other policies that we need to put into place going forward to to help us get there, and. You know, it's like reducing the soft costs for installing all this. In order for us to get to 100% renewable energy uh, and the distributed future, there's going to be a lot of investment and a lot of projects that we're going to have. And so bringing down the cost and the barriers to, to getting those permitted uh, is, is going to be super important for our future. And it's something we're laser focused on at HSEA uh, as well. Beautiful. Would that be primarily through tax credits or... A whole uh, well, so investor fund funding financing, or well, um, obviously um, the tax credit is an important uh, tool, policy tool for the you know for the federal government for and for Hawaii to achieve these goals. Um, but also talking about you know um, improving permitting processes uh, oh. and you know an online permitting tool uh, tools oh. and things like that. We are. HSEA is a member of an organization called the Solar App Campaign. The Sol Solar App is a uh, online permitting system developed by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, and you know we are working with with uh, getting that implemented uh, across you know as many jurisdictions as we can. Uh, re most recently, um, Energy Secretary uh, Granholm, um, you know, uh, launched an initiative with Solar App. And challenged um, states and jurisdictions to 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 really speed up the pace of of getting solar app implemented. And we're so we're working uh, with our with our partners on the mainland um, in you know California, uh, back east, and other states to 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 get that solar app uh, implemented as quickly as possible because it really will. Um, it not only will lower the time um, and cost of of permitting, but it's also going to make it more, um, you know, you know, you know, more, you know, safer because it's a best in practice system that will really help um, jurisdictions uh, make sure that 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 projects are being put in correctly and that they're being designed correctly for public health and safety. Beautiful. And guess which state is going to be leading the entire nation? Little old Hawaii, especially if you have anything to say about it. <laughs> Rocky Mould, President, Hawaii Solar Industry Association. And my honored guest, you've given us a peek into the clean future, Rocky. Thank you so much. Signing off is Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. See you next time. <laughs>